And good morning, friends. Welcome to The Bright Side. I am Pharmacist Ben. Thanks for joining us. Our number 844-236-6010. 844-236-6010. If you have questions about the longevity products, nutrition, prescription drugs, if you want to wean yourself off your meds and get on a good nutritional supplement program, we can help you. Likewise, if you have a comment or a success story you'd like to share, 844-236-6010 is our number on The Bright Side. If you want to purchase longevity products, head to brightsideben.com, pharmacistben.com, or criticalhealthnews.com. You can purchase longevity products off the websites, or you can call 866-735-2470, 866-735-2470, and ask about joining the Brightside Ben team for a one-time $30 fee. You can be in business for yourself and help spread the word about the power and importance of a good nutritional supplement program. Make some money at the same time. Be your own boss. Work out of the home. Be financially independent and work on your health as well because when you're selling longevity products and you're involved with the longevity business, you get to learn a lot about nutrition, a lot about health, and a lot about supplementation. Call 866-735-2470 for more information or click on the Join the Team link at brightsideben.com, pharmacistben.com or criticalhealthnews.com, and make sure you take a look at our Truth Skin Health products at truthtreatments.com. Never any preservatives, fragrances, fillers, waxes, emulsifiers, water, silicon, vegetable oil, nothing your skin doesn't need or doesn't want in any of our Truth Skin Health products. They're all available available at truthtreatments.com, truthtreatments.com. All right, our number, 844-236-6010. We'll get your calls next segment. We have a guest coming up at the bottom of the hour. Jeffrey McClong, or Joffrey McClong, is an author and a uh, personal growth teacher and, as she calls herself, a common sense activist. And we're going to talk about anger and blame as a cry for help. Her books are The Heart of the Matter, and she has another book called How Learning to Say Goodbye Taught Me How to Live. We'll talk to Joffrey McClong at the bottom of the hour. Get your calls next segment, 844 844- Two three six sixty ten. We've been talking about the thyroid and the adrenal glands, and uh, it's always relevant to talk about the thyroid, especially in the world of health and, and nutrition and disease, because there's no chronic illness that doesn't have an element of thyroid dysfunction. I was reading something really interesting today, and kind of made me got my attention, and then it made me mad. Uh, this is from Endocrine Web, which is a uh, which is a, we- a website that uh, deals with en- various endocrine disorders. Hashimoto's thyroid or Graves' disease or pretty much all thyroid problems are endocrine disorders. The endocrine, gl- endocrine system involves the various glands. Uh, anyway, so on this website, endocrine, uh, endocrineweb.com, there's an article about thyroid disorders and the coronavirus. Now, if you understand, if, if you know even a little bit about how the body works, if you know even a little bit about how the thyroid works, you know that once the thyroid is suppressed, everything's going to be messed up, and that includes the immune system. And that's why I was so blown away to read this quote from Dr. Jenna Mammon, MD, PhD, MD, medical doctor, PhD. She's a, a, a doctor of philosophy. She's a doctor doctor uh, and an endocrinologist, Johns Hopkins University, one of the... M- m- most uh, highly renowned of all the medical schools, Johns Hopkins University. Uh, She says, uh, quote, about the thyroid, about Hashimoto's thyroid specifically, quote, it is an autoimmune disorder, but it is not an immune compromised state that would lead us to anticipate problems with COVID-19, an additional problem with COVID-19, unquote. Are you kidding me? How could anybody who even understands a smidgen about the body and how the body works, let alone an MD and a PhD and an endocrinologist, say something that's ridiculous. That having a thyroid problem is not going to affect the way you respond to a viral infection. Are you kidding me? This is the kind of craziness that we hear from the medical model. This is the kind of craziness that we hear from people who we trust. Our authorities, our health authorities, and it's why I say you cannot trust your health authorities to take care of your body. Your body, our bodies are our business, and we have to become our own health authorities because the medical strat- the medical model, the med- medical paradigm, and I'm not blaming any individuals here, the medical paradigm is, is that your body doesn't matter when it comes to how it responds to a microbial or an outside attack, uh, an attack from the outside. That's why for so many years doctors said, oh, it doesn't matter what you eat. It has nothing to do with your, with your health. Or, or dermatologists would say, oh, your acne has nothing to do with, with what you're eating. That's a myth. 
the idea that you can separate out the disease from the condition of the body, from the baseline condition of the body, is not only foolish, but it makes us, it leads us to a, a, into a situation where we don't pay attention to our lives. We just pay attention to the doctors and to the medical authorities. How many people who have been diagnosed with COVID, how many people have been symptomatic with COVID, how many people have been hospitalized with COVID were hypothyroid? Has anybody checked for that? How do we know that hypothyroidism isn't the major risk factor for, uh, for, for being symptomatic from a viral infection? And keep in mind, you may think or you may have your, uh, your, your uh, testing done and it may come back that you're in WNR, within normal ranges. That doesn't mean anything. If you are symptomatic in any way, shape, or form, you have to regard it as being at... at the very least, uh, subclinically hypothyroid. You may be full-blown hypothyroid, but the very least, you have to regard the thyroid. It's the, tri it's, it's the third point on the triangle of disease. It's the jumping-off point to all biochemical breakdown, which tells you. I'm, I'm not saying that, that viral infections, that microbial infections, are caused by thyroid problems, but I'm saying that if you have a thyroid problem, you're going to be more susceptible to infections of any kind. That means... Working on your thyroid should be a major strategy for protecting yourself from being symptomatic. It's way more important to deal with thyroid health than to wear a mask. It's way more important to control your thyroid and your blood sugar, for that matter, and the adrenal glands, which we talked about yesterday as being behind thyroid problems, than to try to hide in the house. Why are we not focusing on locus of control where we have control? Why are we running away? Why are we running away from life instead of taking care of our own health business? All right, I know I'm preaching to the choir here, but I just couldn't believe when I read this quote this morning. We would, we would not expect to have additional problems with COVID-19 if you're hypothyroid. This is from an endocrinologist and a medical doctor at Johns Hopkins. Crazy, 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 people. If you're dealing with a thyroid problem and you're trying to deal with it by taking iodine, I love iodine. It's really, really important, but it's not the magical cure for a thyroid problem unless you're full-blown goiter. The goiter is when you have a big old lump in your throat, a huge, huge swollen throat. That's a goiter, and that's a, that's a classic sign of iodine deficiency, and you have to be like zero. You have to have really significant iodine deficiency for that to occur. For most people who are dealing with hypothyroidism, it's not an iodine deficiency problem, although... Although iodine is a stupendously valuable, important, and for many people deficient nutrient that we would all do well to supplement with, um, with a, at least with a little iodorol. Talk about that when we come back from our break and take your phone calls. 844-236-6010 is our number. You're listening to The Bright Side. We'll return right after this. We're back on the bright side. Got lines open for you. 844 236 6010. We'll get your calls here in just a minute. We've got uh, Joffrey McClong coming up, author, teacher, and independent filmmaker. She's going to talk to us about her books, The Heart of the Matter and How Learning to Say Goodbye Taught Me How to Live. She's a personal growth author and self love teacher and a common sense activist, as she identifies herself. We'll talk to Joffrey. Uh, at the bottom of the hour, and we'll get your calls here in yeah, just a minute or two, 844 is our number. All right, so uh, iodine uh, and the thyroid, uh, a lot of people are under the impression, and, you know, it's not their fault because we get told this all the time, oh, you know, you have hypothyroidism, take iodine. Well, it's not that simple, folks, unfortunately. One of the big problems with the iodine, by the way, first of all, iodine is only found or is largely found in the ocean. It's found in seafood, largely. Um, shellfish, tuna, scallops, sardines, salmon. These are the best sources of iodine. Uh, sushi, uh, shrimp. Uh, these are all good sources of iodine. Sea vegetables, uh, seaweed. I love seaweed as a health tool. And in the future, seaweed is going to be a major source of nutrition for people. Uh, seaweed is a good source of iodine. Strawberries and dairy products are good sources of iodine as well. Uh, when we think of iodine, you think of, uh, most people think of the thyroid. And for good reason, but it's involved in the production of thyroid hormone. You can't make thyroid hormone without iodine, but iodine is important for the breasts, the ovaries, the thymus, uh, the brain, the digestive system, the pancreas in particular, and of course the adrenal glands. And iodine deficiency will cause problems in all of these areas, not just the thyroid. 
iodine uh, deficiency, even though um, full-blown deficiency is not is not common. You don't see people, you don't see goiters very much. A hundred years ago, you used to see goiters all the time. Then they started putting iodine in salt, and people got a, the bare bones minimum of iodine. But here's the problem with iodine, at least in terms of getting enough iodine. I mean, most people aren't going to have to deal with complete full-blown deficiencies, but to get maximum amounts of iodine for optimum functioning, number one, you need to eat iodine, but number two, you should be supplementing with iodine and not counting on the iodine you get from salt. And oh, by the way, if you're drinking tap water, there's a really good chance that you're going to have a problem with iodine because fluoride blocks iodine. Fluoride antagonizes iodine. So does bromine, by the way, brominated flour and brominated vegetable oil. It's found in soda pop. So between bromine and fluoride, even though we are getting a, a smattering of iodine and iodine salt, it's very likely that many people are iodine deficient. The big thing about iodine deficiency is it will affect the female reproductive system. In addition to affecting the, the thyroid and affecting the adrenals, et cetera, it's going to affect the way, we ha way women handle estrogen, and that's one of the reasons why one of the major signs of iodine deficiency is fibrocystic breasts. In fact, fibroids anywhere can involve iodine deficiency. So if you're, uh, if you're dealing with estrogen problems, reproductive problems, female reproductive problems, and certainly if you're dealing with adrenal issues, in fact, if you're dealing with any glandular issues, in fact, if you're dealing with anything, in fact, even if you're not dealing with anything, get yourself on some iodorol, I-O-D-O-R-A-L, iodorol, or iodorol, some people say. Uh, take 12.5 to 25 milligrams of iodine, which is a lot more than the recommended daily allowance. A lot, a lot, a lot more. If you want to read up on iodine, read David, Dr. David Brownstein's blog on iodine. He talks a lot about it. Uh, and Dr. Guy Abraham as well talks a lot about iodine. I'm going with these iodine experts more than I'm going with the RDA, and both of them suggest taking 12.5 to 25 milligrams of an iodine iodide blend like you'll find in iodorol, I-O-D-O-R-A-L. It's the iodine I recommend. Of course, you also want to make sure you're eating iodine in seafood and shellfish and... Uh, and strawberries and dairy products if you're doing dairy as well. All right, and by the way, pregnant moms or moms who are nurse feeding will have smarter babies and healthier babies if they supplement with iodine and it comes out of the breast milk or uh, if uh, while you're pregnant you're supplementing with iodorol. All right, 844-236-6010 is our number. Let's go to the phones and say good morning to Shauna. What is up, Shauna? Sorry, I always hey. cut you off here, so you get, as much, you get, a, you get a, a solid four minutes here. What's going You're on? Awesome. How can we help you? Um, thank you. I was going to ask you how you spell the idol or whatever. So that was great. Um, and your guest speakers have been amazing. Thank you. Oh, um, thank you. I'm I appreciate that. Wanting to know on this, um, the resistant bands that you inflate on your biceps and on your thigh, thigh muscles, and then you exercise. They're great. To, they're, to, okay. They're, so my question is not robbing Mother Nature and then we're not no. applied a no, certain you're just, amount. No, you're giving yourself an extra uh, extra resistance. It's great. And I love bands, by the way. You, what you're talking about is a little bit different. But you know those bands you can buy on Amazon? or, uh -huh. or They are awesome That's for getting great. a workout. I've been, oh, they're just so good. You don't, have to, you don't need a gym. You can do it right out of your house. And you can do every single exercise. You can work every single body part. You can do every exercise you can imagine that you can do with weights. You can do with bands. They're just really, really handy way to... To work out, especially for older folks, especially and for folks who don't want to deal with going to the gym, you can just do it while you're watching TV. You can get just as good a workout as you can with weight by lifting weights with bands while you're at home watching TV. You know, just just sitting in your in your house. Even while you're sitting down, you could do leg exercises with bands. I mean, they're just and they're inexpensive too. They're just really, really invaluable. I personally okay. have been using them for a while now. Awesome. Probably a YouTube okay. to show you some good yeah, exercises. Oh, yeah, there's tons, tons of YouTubes on the bands. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. I just thought we were born with so much HGH and that if you're doing that, you're going to be robbing it from when you really, no. really need it. Okay. No, no, no. That's a, one of the best ways to make uh, make your own. I'm assuming you mean human growth, growth hormone when you say yeah. HGH. Yeah. One of the best ways to make your own growth hormone is resistance training. In fact, all of the strategies that we talk about here on the Bright Side, calorie restriction, keeping your sugar down, intermittent fasting, nutritional supplementation, slow deep breathing, pretty much everything we talk about on the Bright Side as far as uh, being good for your health involves helping your body make HGH. It's one of the mechanisms. Okay. The more calories we eat, the more domesticated we become, the more sedentary we are, 
uh, the less human growth hormone we make and the shorter our youth and the shorter our longevity as well. All right? Woohoo! Thank you. All You're right. Awesome. Be good. Have a great day, Shauna. Thanks for calling. Barry, you get the last word. What's up, buddy? How you doing? All right. I, I'm hoping you, uh, if I have any problems, you'll bear with me with this phone. Uh, I wanted to ask you um, uh, two quick questions. Uh, support is uh, a breathing technique technique that you would, uh, you know. You want a good uh, breathing technique? You, you're looking for a good Here, Here's the deal with breathing techniques. There's lots of them. They all have their, their benefits. Uh, the, I like the simple one where you do circular breathing, and that is by circular breathing, I mean you don't stop between the inhale and the exhale. You inhale for four to five. Barry, I, I don't know what's up with the phone, bro. I, it's, there's this awful, awful connection. i got to let you go, but hopefully, hopefully you can listen, and I'll talk about I'll talk about deep breathing. I, I really apologize, for, uh, Barry, but that's just an awful phone you got there, man. Get a new phone. So uh, anyway, there's a lot of different deep. There's a lot of different breathing techniques out there, and a lot of. It's not like one is the best breathing technique, but the one I use is called circular breathing. It involves not taking any, uh, uh, not pausing between your inhale and exhale. I know there's different types, and some people say pause at the inhale and pause at the exhale, but or after the inhale and after the exhale, but. Um, I, Circular breathing, you just go inhale, exhale, inhale, exhale. You inhale slowly. It's super important to do it slowly, and it's super important that your belly goes out when you do it. Four to five seconds to start, and then as you get good at it, you can do 10 to 15 seconds on the inhale, all the way to the bottom of your belly. In fact, all the way to the bottom of your feet, if you can do it that way. And then, um, and then when you exhale, you blow it all out, and you make sure you get every last drop of air out. Uh, maybe 15, uh, 10 to 15 seconds, maybe maybe 7 or 8 seconds to start, 10 to 15 seconds. Work yourself into 10 to 15 seconds. Hope that helps. And uh, thanks for your call, Barry. We've got Joffrey McClung coming up in our next segment. Okay, we're back on the bright side. I am Pharmacist Ben. Thanks for joining us. We're on the air Monday through Friday, 8 to 9 Pacific, 10 to 11 Central Time and 24-7 on the archive page at brightsideben.com. Also on benfuchsarchives.com. We have a search engine up on benfuchsarchives.com. And thank you to Peter in the UK for setting that one up. Also, you can purchase longevity products at brightsideben.com, pharmacistben.com, or criticalhealthnews.com. And don't forget to take a look at our Truth Skin Health products at truthtreatments.com, never any preservatives, fragrances, fillers, waxes, emulsifiers, silicon, water, vegetable oil, nothing your skin doesn't need or doesn't want in any of my pharmacist formulated Truth Skin Health products, all designed in my compounding pharmacy for healing burns and cuts and scrapes and wounds and post-surgical trauma. And healing, as it turns out, is beauty. Healthy skin is beautiful skin. Check out all our Truth Skin Health products at truthtreatments.com, truthtreatments.com. All right, I am excited to have our next guest on, Joffrey McClung is an author, a teacher, she's a filmmaker, she's been in theater, and she is a now a personal growth author with two books uh, that are available. One is called The Heart of the Matter, and the other is How Learning to Say Goodbye Taught Me How to Live. Please welcome to the bright side, Joffrey McClung. Hello, Joffrey. Hey, Ben. How are you doing? Thanks for am having I, me. Am I saying that correct, Joffrey? Oh, you said Joffrey. it perfectly. Okay, good. So you, uh, first of all, before I get into what you're what you're talking, what your topic is here. How did you go from theater to self-development and personal growth? Well, I was in theater, and then I went into television production, and I've always done spiritual growth and read every mm. book possible on it. And then when my mother uh, got sick and died, I um, basically came out of the spiritual closet because I needed to do something creative, and I was um, had moved to Texas to take care of her. So suddenly I opened the spiritual door and started mm. talking about what I'd been doing for 30 years. I love it. What? Give me uh, the one book that had the made the biggest impact on you. Spiritual book that had the biggest impact on you. Is there one? Is there one? Oh gosh, there's. I, I, I've read over two hundred to fifty, uh, two hundred and fifty books. There's no one really, that just that jumps out well, as being that changed your life dramatically. No, well, I, I, I don't have need to. to yeah. No, that's all right. I would have to say it was either Seth Speaks, which is very Got metaphysical. It. Yeah, yeah, I've read uh, it. But it opened me. Okay, you know what I'm talking about. That I know me exactly. The idea that about. you create your own reality that yeah. really kind of opened my whole, my whole. That was thinking. one of the. That was one of the first books I read. Also, by the way, Seth Speaks. 
Uh, and oh, it okay. is a bit heady. And it is a bit heady, uh, but oh, it Lord, was very, yeah. very powerful. So, uh, all right. So um, I'm, we're going to have fun talking then. We've got a lot in common here, it sounds like. So self-love is a very intriguing topic, a, 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 an intriguing phrase to me. What does that exactly mean? Isn't love kind of a vague term? And doesn't that make self-love really like hard to explain or hard to teach? Well, I think a lot of people think self-love is about self-esteem or uh, building up your sense of who you are. But really, the way I describe it is that self-love is the knowing in your heart, because your personality can have walls all around your heart, but knowing in your heart that you are lovable, loving, and loved. Now, what I mean by lovable, loving, and loved, then, is lovable means you know you are worthy of love in the universe's eyes. Nobody on the planet may love you. You may be alone on top of the mountain, but in the universe's eyes, you are worthy Worthy of love. And then loving means that expressing that loving heart, you do it good enough. A lot of us walk around thinking we're not doing it good enough. But you, mm. when you express that loving heart, now we have walls around it, but when you express that loving heart, it's good enough. And then the third component is you're loved, means that you exist, therefore you matter and you are valued by the universe, not for what you do, not for what you will do, but because you are you. When you have those three components, then you are building in self love. Mm, I love that. Now, uh, what is the relationship between self-love and Christ or Christianity or what you hear when you read about love in the New Testament? Well, I think the New Testament, I was raised in that, so I do understand the idea of uh, unconditional love, which I think uh, Jesus was talking about in the New Testament. Unconditional love, forgiveness, grace, all of those are part of uh, self-love. You have to practice grace with yourself. You have to practice. You have to figure out what does unconditional love feel like to you. So I think the New Testament has a lot of good things. I think it's been misinterpreted, but I do think it has a lot of good things in there. Is there a way to relate self to, to be a, 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 a more traditional religious person and still have self-love and still, or, or still focus on self-love as an important aspect of your spirituality and be an, a traditional Christian person or traditional Jewish person or Muslim person? So, I mean, because I've talked to a lot of people who have different religions. I lived in New York for over 30 years, so I knew a lot of people of different religions. And I stay away from what their beliefs are in their religion and talk about the self-love, the unconditional love that I think all religions talk about, and how to practice that on yourself. So I think you can do self-love. Now, if your religion is saying you're evil and you're going to hell and burn, then we have to talk a little bit about that. Maybe Mm -hmm. you're okay. (laughs) But other than that, I do believe you can have a religious viewpoint and have self-love it seems like the religion kind of takes you away from self-love or, or redirects your attention away from loving self and towards loving something else well i think it's been misinterpreted like i said about the new testament i think it's been great and grossly misinterpreted i think the just the crux of the new testament was unconditional love and you are forgiven are loved because of who you are i do think religions tend to make it follow us do what we say do it our way mm-hmm. or else you will go wherever we say you're going to go. That is an issue. But that's something you can work on on your own, because like I say, you're going to start asking yourself questions. Why do I believe what I believe? That may help you kind of reconstruct your religion. Okay, now, when you and I were going to talk originally, we were going to talk pre-Father's Day, because you have some interesting things to say about a gender difference when it comes to self-love. Talk a little bit about men and self-love, why men need more self-love and what men can do about why it's an issue for men and what men can do about it. Well, I think there is a difference. I do think we all need it, both men and women, and I think in general we all need the same things. But I think the difference between men and women is women are, tend to be much more open to hearing conversations about the heart, how the heart works, what is self-love, all that sort of information, while men tend to go from the head, go from the brain. Now, when I talk about self-love, I connect the brain and the heart together. They need to be in sync. But men tend to see self-esteem as their self-love. Well, self-esteem can go up or down depending on what you're receiving from the outside world. Self-love does not matter what you're receiving from the outside world. It rests within your heart, Mm. and you can move through the world knowing no matter what somebody's saying to you, you have self-love. Yes, yeah, self-esteem and self-love are different things, but they get collapsed sometimes. They get confused sometimes. And, oh, I think and, definitely. And one comes from the outside, one comes from the inside. Like, oh, that's the we, whole point. And yeah, self-love yeah, is that, about coming from the inside. So what are a couple things men can do, specifically as a guy? I, I'm, I'm curious, what can men do to, to add more self-love to their daily lives? 
Well, one of the things I talk about is self-gratitude. I say that both for men and women, but I think men can definitely use it. Now, when I say self-gratitude, it's not like say I did that job great. It's about taking your day, looking at it, and then being grateful for who you are. Perhaps you gave some money to somebody on the street. That's being self-practicing self-gratitude for your generosity. You want to practice generosity. Perhaps you made somebody laugh at work. You want to be self-gratitude for your sense of humor. You Mm. find things within yourself versus what you're doing in your job or how much money you're making. You look for things you're doing that bring you self-gratitude for how you are and who you are. That's one of the big things I think I talk about a lot. All right. So you got two books now. Or is it just two or do you have more? I got The Heart of the Matter um, and Finding Your Way Back to Self-Love. And oh, I'm, oh. Uh, finish, I'm sorry. And I'm finishing up my third book, which is uh, my personal story of how I found self-love. Okay, so we're going to take a commercial break and talk about the books. I'm Pharmacist Ben. We're talking to Joffrey McClong, author, teacher, and uh, self-love teacher, self-love expert. You're listening to The Bright Side. We'll be back right after this. Don't go away. We're back on the bright side. I'm Pharmacist Ben. We're talking to Joffrey McClong. Hey, Joffrey, before we get into your books, is there a difference between self-love and self-respect, or is it just semantics? Well, I think self-respect is a part of self-love, but self-love covers a lot more things. Like I said, self-gratitude, uh, mm. self-appreciation, self-respect, self-trust. There's a lot of angles of self-love, but self-respect is definitely part of self-love. Okay, so let's talk here about your books. I, w- I want to talk about the heart of the matter, but before you get to that, uh, your memoir, your spiritual memoir, as you call it, is How Learning to Say Goodbye Taught Me How to Live. What does that mean? Saying goodbye is, is, is I'm really fascinated with the concept of endings, ending relationships, ending jobs, ending experiences. Tell us about saying goodbye and why that's so important to understand. Well, that came out of a period that I had said goodbye to New York. I had said goodbye to my job. I was suddenly in Texas. My mother was dying or dead at that point. My best friend was in the process of dying. Saying goodbye was in every area of my life. And the book is written following my best friend and our uh, journey together of doing our inner work as she was battling stage four breast cancer. So it was really at kind of the cliff notes of how to stay awake when you're in the midst of loss. Love that. Staying awake when you're in the midst of loss, like not running away from it. And, and this time, it seems like we're, that's what we're experiencing now collectively is a kind of sense of loss, do you think? Oh, I think definitely. I think we're experiencing a sense of loss, but I do think good things are going to come out of it, frankly. Yeah, like what? I think what, empathy. Your, I think uh-huh. compassion. I think kindness, all of these energies that we put on the back burner for so many decades, frankly, are going to start to be bounced up and be much more important to our lives. Uh, again, it's, it's a struggle, and there's always conflict, but I think out of the conflict, we will be much more awake, much more aware of our empathy and our compassion, which makes a better world, frankly. Do you think it's a kind of birth? Oh, I think it's definitely a leap. I call it a leap. I think we take leaps in our life uh, that push you into a new level of understanding. And I think this is definitely a period of leaping. Mm, Very nice. So the heart of the matter, workbook and guide to finding your way back to self-love. Talk to us about that. That is literally a workbook, and God is literally everything I did to find my way back to self-love. It has the discussions that I talk about uh, in each chapter. It has questions. It's so important to ask yourself questions. Why do I believe what I believe, and why do I feel what I feel? And you have to be honest with yourself, which alone takes some time. So, uh, and then it, go ahead. I was going to say, like inquiry, inquiry on why you why you are a certain way. That's what you're talking about. Yeah, why you are, but why do you believe? Like, I mean, I was I was raised in a certain religion, certain beliefs, and I started asking, well, why do I believe that? And I began to expand it. I began to open it up to make it more fuller versus keeping it, you know, uh, straightforward in, in, in the box that was given to me. We're all raised from our parents and our teachers and our friends from when we're little to believe certain things about the world, and then we fit into the world. Well, some of those things were just passed on to them from their parents. Mm. That doesn't make them necessarily true for you. So, in other words, you have to, like, examine what you're doing and examine your beliefs. And so many of them, as you say, are preconceived. But through inquiry and examination, you can deconstruct them, change them. You get some control over them, correct? Exactly. You get to choose what you believe, guys. Mm. If you can change some of your beliefs, you can change your life. But you've got to change your beliefs. Your beliefs are creating your life. Do you have a meditation practice? Oh, yes. 
and there's meditations within the book, and each chapter is a huge meditations in each book. And these are meditations that I did. They're not all that I did. I meditated every night. But they are some of the ones that worked for me. And I again say in the book, use it to start off and then allow your imagination to take you where you need to go. Really, my imagination took me where I needed to go. So there's so many ways you can define meditation. People have, a lot of times people will ask me what it is, and I, I'm always kind of, it always comes out differently when I try to explain it. So in your words, and as you see it, what is meditation? Meditation is simply focusing your attention. That's what I call meditation. You can lay mm. down. You can sit up. I used to do it in a hot in a hot tub after I get home from work or the gym. I'd lay in the hot tub. I'd put music on. Music works really well for meditation. And I put music on, and I would go into meditation. It's literally focusing your attention. So it doesn't matter what you focus your attention on. Well, I think it does matter. <laughs> If you're going into if you're going in to do something important, you you you'll notice your mind will tend to want to take you away from it. My mind used to decorate my house, and I say, okay, I just spent ten minutes decorating my house again. What am I trying to avoid? So you pay attention to where your mind's taking you, because your mind will take you away from the meditation. That's a good clue to understand how your ego works. Yeah, there's something about the mind that just doesn't want you to sit still. Blaise Pascal was a physicist, uh, was a mathematician and a philosopher in the, I think the 17th or 16th century. And he said all of man, man's problems could be reduced to not wanting to sit in a room alone by himself. And it seems, and that was it's the 1600s and it's true to, it's the same, it's, it's true today as well. What is it about the mind that won't let us sit still? Well, I think we think we're, 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 our mind is in charge of us, and we don't realize we are actually in charge of our mind. People say, I have all these negative thoughts. You can actually change your negative thoughts, but you have to be willing to do the work. A lot of people don't want to do the work, frankly. And you just said something about nobody wants to be alone in the room. That's the other difference between men and women. Women do like to be alone at times. Men tend to not like to be alone. That is a huge difference. And I think doing spiritual work, doing metaphysical work, doing your meditations will help men to understand it's okay to be alone and it's okay to hear your own thoughts it what well, depends on what those thoughts are <laughs> there's some people that that have some pretty horrible thoughts and I, actually you know what i have to say sometimes i find my mind taking myself off into horrible thoughts how do you get around that how do you, how, and, and 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 along the same vein you said something about we have control over our minds most of us think we are our minds who is this we that separate separate from our minds that can control the mind well, there's two of this. There's the ego who's sitting there in the body, and I call it the ego. You can call it whatever word you want, frankly. But it's the ego, and you think you are your mind. And you forget your heart is part of your, your whole physical, well, your whole makeup of your body is part of your heart. But your mind, we think our mind is in charge of us, but we've never been trained how to work with our mind. Like we've never been trained how to work with our emotions. Because our parents weren't trained, so they passed it on to us, and we pass it on to our kids. You can train your mind. You can... If you get, ne look, I used to get negative thoughts too. This is how it began to do my spiritual work to begin with. But if you can train your mind to say, okay, what, why am I having this negative thought? What happened in my life that brought this negative thought up? What triggered me? If you start to ask yourself questions, what triggered me to have this negative thought? You begin to see how your mind works and you begin, begin to change those beliefs. And I don't have those negative beliefs anymore, Ben, frankly, but it took me a while to get there. So where does, when you talk about negative beliefs and you talk about how the mind kind of thinks it's in charge, or the ego, if you will, thinks it's in charge, where does fear fit into the equation? Well, fear is part of our makeup. We do need fear to not run off a, a cliff. We need to be afraid of going to the edge so we don't fall off the cliff. Fear is necessary to live in a physical world, but we take it to the extent where we fear everything. I think mm -hmm. it happens from when you're a little kid. Things happen, and you, you misconstrue what's happening as your own fault. So you create these negative beliefs that I've got to be careful not to do this or I'll get in trouble, whatever it may be. Fear tends to get overblown to the point that it grabs us by the heart and keeps us prisoner. Fear is something we have to look at. We have to go to our heart work. I really stress the, emo the emotional work in this work a lot. We tend to not work with emotions. We tend to think, I'll change my mind. You gotta change your heart too. Uh, if you go and work with your emotions, you begin to realize fear is arisen out of that you're not good enough, you're not lovable enough, and you're all alone in this world. When you deal with that area, you'll be able to conquer a lot of your own fears. How can you, we got about a minute here, how can you apply what you just said to the 
fear that seems to be saturating the public mind or the public domain in, in the last few months, the fear of, of infection, if you will. How would you, how would you take what you just said, the wisdom of, of dealing with fear in, gener- in a general sense and apply it to the specific kind of fear that we're dealing with now as, as, a, as a whole, as a collective? Well, I would say as a collector, there is there is a pandemic. That is a word we have to use. It is a pandemic. It is part of being physical in this world that there are certain diseases around. I think it's to realize that I can do something about that. I can wear a mask. I can do you know six, stay six feet apart from people. There are things that you can do during the pandemic to be safe and realize that we're going to get through this. It's just going to move, take time, and we're going to get out of it, frankly. And and you're positive. You have you're hopeful. You see good things coming out of all this. Oh, I think this is a good thing. I think it's a good thing. I really do. I think we're going to have more compassion, more empathy, and more kindness, and hopefully a whole lot more self love. Thank you so much, Joffrey. How do people get a hold of you? Do you do one on ones, by the way, one on one sessions? Yeah, I sure do. You can go to my website. The easiest way to go to my website is it's all about self love dot com. I T S all about self love dot com. Take you to my website. Awesome. Joffrey, thank you so much. God bless you. Good luck with everything. Joffrey thank McClung. You. Have a great day. Thank you. That was jo- Joffrey McClung, author, teacher. Her book's The Heart of the Matter, a workbook and guide to finding your way back to self love. Second book, How Learning to Say Goodbye, Taught Me How to Live. And her website is Joffrey McClung, J O F F R E M C C L U N G dot com. Also, How I Found Self Love dot com. That's all the time we have for today. Thanks for listening, friends. I am Pharmacist Ben. Have yourselves a wonderful, beautiful, awesome, spectacular day. We'll talk to you later, folks. Bye for now.